It's been a while since we aired an expedition video, so we thought we'd add a short insight to our activities before the end of the year. Last year, the AYR was more physically active than ever before, producing more results than in previous years and displaying footage never before seen. We've also been proactive in documentaries, radio, podcasts and television. This year, on my behalf, injury set in, limiting myself physically. That said, we still managed to have more trips of adventure than a lot of people would have in their lifetimes. At the end of last year, we conducted our last trip to Gary Bar. The team consisted of three groups of two. The same crew as before when we had our camp visitor. Wade and Gary, Buck and Al, and myself and Steve. Gary and Wade took up residence at Wade's World. Buck and Al went up the hell. While myself and Steve set up our hammocks on the side of a fast running creek on lower ground. I had a mystery pain on the side of my ribs that, that no scan could explain, and it was agonising, and it affected every move I made. Immediately for myself and Steve, the night felt unsettled. It was one of those feelings that had us on guard. The running creek was half the problem, as the running water both blocked any outside noises, but often resembled confusing noises of walking in water and voices. That was a massive crack, I heard that. That is a mystery. We would be 100 metres up the creek west from your location. Almost in line with it. It was the most bizarre feeling of uneasiness. That when the other crews came by, we didn't want them to leave. We felt unsafe and vulnerable. Not a feeling we're accustomed to. During the night, Gary recorded some tree taps in the distance. Everyone moved stealth through the forest, using their thermals while myself and Steve were becoming more freaked out back at our camp. It was time consuming and a painful task to get in the hammock with my phantom injury, which felt like a knife in the side of the ribs with every movement. Once in the hammock, it was very hard to breathe and I couldn't move. Then the forest seemed to come alive. It sounded like something walking around our camp with the contributing and confusing sounds of walking water and mumbling. The hammocks were end to end with our heads only a couple of feet away from each other. What the heck was that? It was a repetitive question for the next few hours. Frustratingly, I couldn't turn to look in any direction, so I had to rely on Steve to be our eyes for each baffling noise, which was constant. We were both becoming confused and annoyed. Then something ran through camp. By 1am we were fed up. I served no purpose being there. I was simply an empty vessel listening to what was going on around us. We were both very unnerved. The crunch time came when a creature unknown walked into our camp and touched us both simultaneously on our heads. That was it. We left everything at base and went back to the cars to sleep for the next couple of hours before daybreak. That was the first time we ever retreated due to fear. The lesson learnt was never to camp by fast moving water. The sound blocks one of your three most important senses, hearing. Not being able to clearly hear your surroundings leaves you confused, vulnerable and wide open to surprises. In the last 12 months we've featured in three documentaries, Cade Moyer's Believe podcast a few times, both as a group in the studio and as individuals. Buck, Sarah and Gary appeared on various podcasts throughout the year. We all appeared on many radio shows across the country, and also Attila Kaldi's Australian documentary Track, which we filmed in Springbrook along with Yowie Dan, or Dan Raymond. We headed over to Witherin, the location of Glenn the Truckee's dramatic sighting. But unfortunately, we were rained out on the night of our expedition in the mountains of Springbrook. Earlier this year, with the assistance of a close contact, we're fortunate enough to have a scat sample from where we dubbed Scat Creek, tested at a New South Wales lab for more information on the origin. It was tested twice on an egg count. 
this process enabled the DPI to identify which native Australian animal it came from, based on their files, by the number of eggs contained in the sample. Ground-dwelling animals produce the most, up to around 14,000, depending on the diet of each animal. This scat produced zero, only leaving two candidates. Hominin or hominid, human or primate. As far as we were concerned, rule out human. We located this sample at the bottom of a remote valley early in the morning. Up until 3am, it had been heavily raining and the scat was found on top of a rock in the middle of a creek. Perfect position to both clean yourself afterwards and washed away with no trace. It's unlikely to be human. Plus the smell was, um, something else. <laughs> oh, what burning. Gary's just leant down to smell it and he's come back in tears. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> oh. My nose is burning, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> it is pretty pungent, like it's really strong. It's sulfurous. It doesn't smell like a normal diet. It certainly it doesn't, doesn't smell. taste like it. <laughs> we'll put a bit behind your ears and see if the girls like it. <laughs> it's unlikely for a human to have been in this valley between 3am and 9 and to have deliberately defecated on a rock in the middle of the creek. Discovery of a zero egg count pointed to the conclusion we we're all looking for. The next step was a DNA test. The scat was sent to Sydney and tested at a university. The results came back saying they felt there's not enough DNA. Our contact suggested this was unlikely due to the amount provided. It was more likely they had no match and couldn't identify the origin. Lack of DNA is the go-to response when they're at a loss for a satisfactory explanation. During the year, Buck, Gary and myself flew to Cairns for a two-hour live show with Cade. Of course, Gary managed to drag out the show for nearly four hours and then the after party for the AYR Facebook. During the course of the year, we conducted nearly 40 outings to various locations finding multiple footprints deep in the mountains, valleys and rainforests. Signs and symbols that were repetitious by design, yet in differing locations and unlikely to be natural falls, with sticks sometimes in their under and over patterns. Abandoned houses hidden deep in the forests. A crude grave hidden away on the side of a rainforest covered mountain with RIP and the name Kira etched on a rock. Intestines and stomach removed from an animal and dumped in a pile. With no signs of tools or teeth marks, no blood or fur, no body, no drag marks, no sign of disturbance, no crime scene. Simply removed and dumped. But there were large bare footprints close by. We discovered a stone throwing hoax by two people pretending to be researchers while on an expedition at Wapa Dam. Ron Quinton was good enough to join us and was unfortunately the victim of these people. Sarah Bignall came up from Victoria on three occasions during the year and joined us for various expeditions at different locations around southeast Queensland, including Springbrook, Ormo, Clagrabar, and a place close to my heart, Kilkeven. Interesting and amusing time for several reasons. Not so much for Gary. He found himself bogged on a swampy, wet, muddy road with the sunken wheel, which then split in the centre, costing us some daylight hours. Should have should have bought a jeep. And Buck lost his drone, only to refind it a month later, sitting on the top of Lantana in a pine forest. Later in the year, I flew back to Cairns for another live show with Cade. This time, Sarah was supposed to have been there. However, on the previous afternoon, she rolled a car that she was driving and couldn't make it. It was a frightening experience for Sarah when the Land Cruiser lost control and slid off the muddy road with the bull bar digging in and flipping the four-wheel drive 360 degrees from head to toe, then rolling on its side. We were all deeply concerned for Sarah, but thankfully she wasn't injured worse than she was, and Miss Golden Tonsils will live on to do another interview. Our most recent members are Al Newton and Wade Matthews. 
Al was a long-time follower of the AYR. Now a loyal and enthusiastic member of the crew and a personality we all enjoy to have around. Wade Matthews is an outdoors man, capable, strong and willing of any task, no matter what the risk. Strong energy and a confident man. Another person you want by your side. And also, aptly dubbed Mr. 2022, Shannon Guthrie, who is now famous near Miss this year. You may remember Shannon from the July witness report from Witherin, where he nearly hit a juvenile yowie while rounding a bend on his motorbike while on his way to work in the early hours of the morning. The quietest of the group. Gary Lynn needs no introduction. He'll introduce himself. A larger-than-life character who saved my butt on many occasions, particularly on the 19th of February this year. Another one of these situations where we find ourselves fighting off more than we can chew. It happens often when we push ourselves in extreme situations, physically and mentally wrecked. But Gary still manages to drag us out. And this guy, Buck Buckingham. Another personality that requires no introduction. Buck is a great artist who works with witnesses, profiling pictures, and has spent thousands of hours creating the art for the AYR's Witness Audio Report videos. They wouldn't be the same without them. If Buck is present on an expedition, the energy suddenly increases by at least 20%. He drives like your great-grandmother on her way to her own funeral, but has one of the best personalities you'd ever want to meet. Providing you don't let him drone on about some sighting he had somewhere, with some guy his name he can't pronounce. We all love Buck and the quip of his rebuttals. Not only that, but he produced the goods in April of last year with the world's best thermal imaging footage of the Yowie. And Steve the Dentist. Self and Steve stretched back to our days in the Blue Mountains many years ago. And speaking of years, I've known Steve for almost 25 of them. Like most long-term friends, you're pretty much family. We spent the majority of our time together researching southeast Queensland, predominantly Kilkeven and the Gold Coast hinterland. From this year's adventures at Beachmont, Garibar, Corumban, L&D, Nunnambar, Witherin, Canungra, Kugel, Kilkeven and Springbrook, to exposing the hoaxes at Wapper Dam. Earlier this month, Buck Buckingham, Shannon Guthrie, Al Newton and myself headed to a location in the GC hinterland to check on any further signs of activity. As we came closer to our location, some of the familiar signs became apparent. While on Cade Moyer's Believe podcast in Cairns last month, I touched on a variety of signs we've become accustomed to in our local areas. The X markers are obvious. Then they're found in most active areas. However, the A-shaped signs might be a little different. And sometimes we find them in an under and over formation, which can't be contributed to a natural fall from the sky. They're similar to the triangles, which are commonly sticks broken and twisted in three points and shaped as a marker. But these are open-ended with a stick placed across the middle. When we arrived at BC, we were immediately faced with a standing X. As the night grew dim, the night's designated firemaster and Mr. 2002, Shannon Guthrie, created some warmth and played some music as an attraction. During the night, we kept protocols of only using red light. What we got? That. That's in wedged in. Really hard. It's only small. That's tiny, and it, it, I'm pulling on it. I'm pulling on it with quite a bit of force, and it, it is not coming out. These here could be a bit of an X marker. I don't know. But that is. That's in sound. In there. That's, that's in there pretty tight. Gary Lynn, who had prior obligations on that particular night, couldn't attend and he was holding the majority of cameras at the time. 
So myself and Shannon Guthrie shared. Also absent was Wade Matthews and Steve, the dentist. And of course Sarah, the rally driver. Standard practices applied during the night, venturing off in different locations. Sometimes Shannon would remain at BC, panning the camera for visitors, while I would have a quiet sit and listen 50 metres upstream. During the night, Team Buck and Al headed down towards the crossroads, a location where Buck witnessed a being walking out of the forest from behind myself and Gary and continue through the forest on the other side of the track. He saw it all happen in real time. Myself and Gary were totally unaware because it made no noise. Buck was confused at the time, which is an unusual. I was walking just ahead of Gary, and Gary being the human eclipse walking behind me blocked any view of me from Buck. To Buck, who was watching over us like Mother Goose with his thermal, he was confused when he saw a being emerge from the bush on the left side, walk across the track and disappear back into the scrub on the right. He thought somehow he'd missed something and it was simply one of us. A flurry of radio calls from Buck came through. I see this thing coming the opposite way, going. And when I say aping, it was, you know, just so... Lumbered over and... Just such a odd thing that I said, well, are you guys coming back? No, no, we're at camp. We, are you at camp? And I said, did you go to the bush? No. Oh. And... Yeah. Myself and Dean looking at each other like, what? what are you talking about? We're back at camp getting shared. What? What do you want to? <laughs> Man, it's great to have these tools, but if I guess something as simple as hitting the record button. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think it was the case that he thought it was one of us. Yeah. So he well, thought yeah. he was watching us, and then when he realised, crap, it wasn't one of them. He kicks himself every second day. Yeah. Yeah. What it was was no Australian native animal. Walking on two feet, supported by two legs, upper torso, slightly bent forward and a conical head shape. It was clearly visible. There was no reason for Buck to have been recording at the time, which is totally understandable. But a missed opportunity he still kicks himself about to this day. Back on track to the expedition report with this night, Buck and Al ventured away from base camp to a location we term the crossroads. Up until this point, it was what I would consider a relatively uneventful night. While edging their way through the darkness, only using their thermals for guidance, Al noticed a heat signature behind a large tree. Buck was also on the target. At the same time, Shannon was guarding base, monitoring sounds of possible lurkers, while I was on the opposite side of BC some 50 metres into the darkness. I too had my eyes on a target of my own. Towards the crossroads, Al began his camera two to three seconds into his heat signature visual as two targets walked out from behind a tree. His camera was set to a heat-seeking setting, partially blocking the view, while Buck's camera captures them in a slightly different position, time and setting. Now, notice how one bends down to pick something up from the ground. Meanwhile, on the eastern side of the camp, something's gained my attention. This was approximately eight feet off the ground, looking through the fork of a tree. You can see where the dark patches are. They're the eyes, and then the one on the nose, which almost looks like a snout. If you pause the video on a large screen, you'll be able to see the holes in the front of the nose and the mouth. It looks like a hairy head. I returned to BC to hear all about Bucknell's two moving violations. Here we go again. Remember when Buck got that footage? And I mean, I wasn't (laughs) overly enthusiastic. And it turned out to be something fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, yeah. We've had all this before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These three are, are sitting there. 
The Shannon's on the video going, that's good. It is good. <laughs> Clear as day. <laughs> it's just like you said. <laughs> and it, it appeared to have shoulders. It, to me, it looked like a human walking. That's why I asked you guys if you were on the track. Human shape, that's I remember you saying that. That's one in the corner. In the centre there by the tree. That head track of ruins are. So, if, I wonder if you can. And I got it on the other side of the tree. Yeah. yeah. See, I've got the corresponding yeah. thing. So, you got it. So, it's, it's yeah, it's like it's hugging the tree and blending in. Well, I've seen that before, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. And then so look how it pops out, it, lo it like it looks out, looks at you and then goes. Oh that yeah, is, yeah. That's, that's walking. walking. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's walking. It was definitely walking. Okay. Yep, through yep, the yep. viewfinder, it's so much bigger. Wouldn't believe. Wouldn't believe.